I had a drug addict by the name of Shorty come to me once and said he had a vision. He, he died and he stood before the judgment and God found out he loved heroin. So he sent him to junkie heaven. And junkie heaven, and I touched on this just a bit last night, Shorty said he was sitting top of a mountain of pure white heroin. They call it dynamite. And as far as the eye could see, thousands of needles and a, an eternal lake of fire and water to cook this stuff with. And he said, Mr. Wook, you know what heaven was? He said, I shot heroin all through eternity and the pile never went down. That's how God judged me because he knew I loved heroin. Well, folks, that's a perverted view of the judgment and what happens when we stand before Christ. But at least Shorty was doing something a lot of American people are not doing. He was thinking about judgment. You see, the hardest thing for an evangelist to do nowadays is to talk about judgment because we're removing all thoughts of gloom and doom out of our minds. In fact, you, you have to compete nowadays with movies like Star Wars, The Exorcist, The Omen. How do you compete with all the sensational things that are happening in the world today? So when I announce a message on the judgment, I know immediately a lot of people are saying, I wonder uh, what he's going to say, sensational enough that I'll not forget it. I'm not going to talk sensationally about it at all. I'm going to try to answer three simple questions about the judgment. Number one, how do we get there? Who's going to be there? How and for what are we going to be judged? All right, I want to get right into it. Question number one, how do we get to the judgment day? One powerful little verse in the Bible sums it all up. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Now, folks, the Bible makes it clear there's an end coming to this world. Some people have the idea it's going to go on and on forever, but there is an end. The Bible said the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat, and there's going to be a time of death, and after death, the judgment. Marvel not at this, for the hours coming, in which all they that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and they shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Now, folks, one day, the booming voice of Jesus is going to be heard around the universe. And just as sure as he called Lazarus out of the grave, he's going to call all the dead who have ever died from the beginning of time, come to the judgment. Those who have done good to resurrection of life, those who have done evil to resurrection of damnation. Now, some people have the mistaken idea that when we stand before the judgment, when we're resurrected, we're going to have misty, see-through souls. There'll be no bodies, just kind of uh, an eerie uh, substance that has no body or substance to it, or, or uh, just a spiritual kind of uh, existence, not according to the Bible. The Bible says we're coming out of the grave with bodies. We are going to have bodies that come out of the grave. Now, young people said, how can that be, Mr. Wilson? The body that goes into the grave, uh, the worm eats it, it returns to dust. What about those who have been beheaded, bodies have been dismembered, uh, eaten by sharks, and, and uh, those who have been thrown to the ocean. How in the world can God bring those bodies out? Well, those are not the same body that comes out of the grave, not the body that goes in. That which thou sowest, thou sowest not that same body which shall be. But God shall give it a body as it pleases him. All flesh is not the same. There are celestial bodies, that's heavenly, and terrestrial, that's earthly. So is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. The dead shall all be raised in incorruption. We shall all be changed. Now, folks, this soul is going to unite with a body specially prepared. Now, those who come out for the resurrection of life, those born-again believers, their souls are going to be joined to a resurrected body like unto God's own body, in his own image, and it's going to be a new incorruptible body. No tear glands, no gallbladder, no liver, because there's no poison in the system, bones that can't be broken, and, and, and a, a voice that can extol the praises of God for an eternity. A supernatural glorified body. Now, I don't know if that appeals to you, but those of us who have known pain, that sure sounds good. To my wife, who's had seven operations for cancer, that sounds mighty good. 
a new body coming out of that grave. Hallelujah. Now, what about the sinner? He gets a celestial body, too. Celestial only, then it lasts for an eternity. But the Bible says that this is a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. Romans 9, 22, a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. God is going to make an outfit, a special body. That soul comes out of the grave, joined to that body as a vessel of wrath outfitted or prepared to endure destruction. Now, <clears throat> this is so very clear in the Bible that God's going to prepare a special body. Now, I believe in a one-by-one, one, one at a time judgment, because every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, and every eye shall behold him. And people say, how could God take that much time to judge everybody who's ever been born in the beginning of time till the last moment of uh, uh, on earth? Well, folks, we forget that in eternity, time shall be no more. Time isn't even a measurement in eternity. We, we're going to have bodies that won't need food. We're going to have bodies that could stand for eons and eons, unaware of time, because time will not even be in existence. And it's not going, the judgment's not finished till uh, Revelation 6.22, I think it is, and God said, it is finished. He's going to begin it, and he's going to finish the judgment. All right, how do we get to the judgment? Some are going to go through this process of dying and being raised again. Now, others are going to be alive and remaining at his coming, the Bible says. And they're going to be taken away from the earth. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And when that happens, there are going to be people alive on this earth with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we all be with the Lord. Now, I don't know if that's a cloud of angels or a physical cloud, but he's coming in a cloud. Now, some people call that the rapture. That term isn't in the Bible. Some people call it the capture. That is neither, so mine's just as good. I call it the evacuation. He's going to evacuate the Jesus people from the earth, the Scripture says. We shall... All stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess of God to God, so every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now, let me stop for just a minute. Some people don't believe in the rapture or the evacuation. They believe there's going to be one final judgment, and that Christ comes at one time at the end of the world, and that there's not two separate comings of Christ in the clouds and one at the end of time. Others believe that there are two or three different judgments. Now, I can't get into all of that doctrine and theology. I do know this, that there's coming a time when we stand before Jesus Christ as the judge. Now, some teach that the Christian stands before the judgment seat of Christ and that sinners go to the great white throne judgment. I'm of the opinion that we all appear before the great white throne judgment. The sinner stands there as uh, to be judged for his sin, the Christian as a redeemed, glorified witness to the judgment. Because at the judgment day, the book of life is there. The Bible says that once we're with Christ, whithersoever the Lamb goes, we go. And if the Lamb goes to the judgment, I want to go there. And I believe that we are that host of witnesses at the great white throne judgment. And I'll refer to that just a bit later. All right, how do we get to the judgment? Some through death. And resurrection, others through this process of being evacuated into his presence. All right. Who all is going to be there? Who's going to be at the judgment day? Now, we know the Bible says, let's, let's focus on the great white throne judgment. A great multitude which no man could number of all nations. Now, folks, I don't know where the judgment day is going to be. Maybe he's got a planet somewhere. I don't know. But standing before Christ the judge one day will be multitudes which no man could number. Now, evidently not even a computer. I don't know. Because there's no man could number that multitude. From all nations of the world, they're standing before Jesus Christ the judge. And listen to this vision of John of that great day. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and they were all judged, every man according to their works. Now, folks, you can sit here now saying, I don't believe any of this. Well, that doesn't change anything. It's still there. 
And you can sit here all you want to and say, I can't accept that. It's still going to happen. And nothing that you say or think is going to change what God's holy word declares to be the truth. The Bible says there's a great white throne and before him the nations of the world. Listen to this. The most terrifying part of John's vision is this. And there was found no place for them. Now, folks, do you remember Apollo going to the moon? They had a TV camera mounted on Apollo, and it showed the earth getting smaller and smaller as they went toward the moon, till finally the earth was just a little speck. Well, folks, get this picture if you will, please. There's no place found for them yet. You see, the sinner has not yet been sent to hell. He's not found his place in hell yet. And the earth he came from is no longer there. The Bible said the first heaven and the first earth are passed away. They're gone. There's no place for them. They're standing before Jesus as a person without a country. They have not yet found. We have not yet entered in to eternal, because the process of judgment is still happening. The Christian is yet not fully entered in. Now he's saved, he's redeemed. But this place that he's prepared for us, listen very closely now, there was no place found for them. Now get this picture, please. The clocks have all stopped now. There's no more day or night. The sun has burned its course. The moon is dissolved. The sea is gone. There's no more green grass or blue sky or lakes or trees or animals. There's no more, there's no more marriage or love or romance. No male or female. There are no more jobs or elections. There are no tomorrows. There are no more homes or boats or cars or ranches or crops. No more government. There's no more preaching. There's no more television. There are no more atheists. The last sermon's been preached. The last minute is ticked away on the clock. The last bottle of liquor's been consumed. The last gambling has been finished. The last homosexual act has been consummated. The last divorce has been finalized. The last atheist has boasted there's no God. It's all over. The fun is over. The chances are gone. The churches are all shut up. The preachers are all silent. The Holy Spirit's no longer convicting. There's no more way of escape. There's not a ray of hope, folks. It's all over. It's judgment day. There's no place left. It's all gone. The Sodomites from Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be there. You remember this tragic story? God sent two angels to the city of Sodom to monitor the wickedness of that city. Can you imagine how wicked Sodom must have been when the whole city of men turned out? That city had gone so corrupt. Hundreds and hundreds of men, sodomites, homosexuals, rapists, sadomasochists, gathered at the home of Lot, trying to beat down the doors and the windows, trying to break in to rape two visiting angels. Now, folks, that city was so embarrassing to God, he sent fireballs from heaven and destroyed it. Now, how wicked Sodom must have been. You stop and think about America for a minute. Think of all the massage parlors. Think of all the X-rated movie houses. Think of all the horrible filth in America now. Think of what we're seeing on television. Programs like Soap and, and, and uh, Maud and all of these terrible, uh, filthy programming now. Think of all the, uh, the, uh, it, the, the pornography, all the filth. And yet God is still blessing us, isn't he? He hasn't destroyed us. God has given us a Christian president. God is still blessed. Well, how, how sinful Sodom must have been because God in his justice could not be blessing us. Now, we've not yet evidently reached that point that Sodom did. What a horrible city this must have been. And the Bible says on the judgment day, they're all going to be there. The Sodomites are going to be lined up. And folks, the whole world is going to have the books open and we're going to find out once and for all how wicked Sodom was. But folks, I want to tell you something. There are going to be people from Reno, Nevada. There are going to be people from this audience, no doubt. At the judgment day, they're going to be judged more severely than the Sodomites of Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, the Lord said there's a class of people he's going to judge more severely. He said, in fact, the Sodomites and Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm going to have more tolerance for them on the day of judgment than I am for people who've heard the gospel time and time again and have rejected it. Let me give it to you from the scripture. And whosoever shall not receive you and hear the gospel, verily I say unto you, 
It shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for them. Did you hear that? God said, I'm going to have more tolerance for a rapist and sodomites and homosexuals on the day of judgment and then for the goodniks and the smuggies who've sat through a thousand Holy Ghost invitations. They've heard 10,000 sermons. They know the gospel. They know the truth and yet they've rejected it. God said, I'm going to, in fact, folks, you can quit telling me how hot hell is going to be for all these sadomasochists and all these pornographers and all these filthy X-rated people in America. You can forget telling me how hell is going to be hot for those kind of people. No, there's, there's another kind of hell. There's, um, there's a greater wrath restored for those who come to meetings and hear the gospel and shake it off. And people whose hearts have grown hard. Now, the Bible also makes it clear that there are going to be people there at the judgment day who have been storing up wrath against that day. You know, there's a bank in heaven. The Christian stores up precious gold and silver, all the fruits of the Spirit. They're, they're likened unto gold, precious silver, jewels, storing up. There's a bank there. Just as sure as you walk into a bank and you stand in front of a teller and you've got a bank deposit book, so it is with God. Listen to me. Sinners have a bank of wrath. I'll read it to you here. But after your hard and impenitent heart, you are treasuring up to yourself wrath against the day of the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Romans 2, 5. Did you hear that? You're treasuring up wrath. Now, folks, I've wondered sometimes how people could sit through my preaching when I'd pour my heart out and I know the Spirit of God was on me and I could feel His power moving through me and I knew I had His words. God, the Holy Ghost, was speaking His truth. And people were so ashen white with conviction. My associates had come to me and say, David, you should have been in the lobby tonight. People were actually stricken with conviction. Their knees were smiting one another. They were ashen white. They had to hold on to their friends as they went out the door. And they shook it off. And it used to bother me. But folks, I know what that means now. Is it just walking out on another evangelist? Is it just walking out? No. It's another deposit in the bank of wrath. Whenever you hear the gospel, someone talks to you about Jesus, you hear the truth. I don't care if it's Rex Humbert on television. I don't care if it's a friend that comes to you. I don't care how you receive it. It may be in church where you go with your wife. A friend took you. You heard the gospel. And you got up and you walked out and said, some other time. That is a deposit in the bank of wrath. The Bible said, your heart is hard. You refuse to receive the knowledge of the truth. So you have made another deposit in the bank of wrath. And on the day of judgment, you have to face that when the books are open, yours is a book of deposits of rejecting his gospel time and time again. Now, also, the Bible said there are going to be people at the judgment day who had a complete knowledge of what it was, and yet they still rejected. They knew all about the judgment day. They could preach it to you. They could talk to you about it. Listen to it. Who, knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. See, these are the people who run with the crowd. They wouldn't dare come and receive Jesus as Lord. They know about the judgment. They know that people who sin like that are worthy of death, but they shake it off. They, they don't want to stand any shame from the crowd. They want to be around their own kind. Jesus said, I shone the light in their eyes. They shut their eyes. I poured the gospel on their ears, and they shut their ears. They refused the knowledge of the truth. They shook it off like water running off a duck's back. Listen, I've got friends like that. We've got relatives, in fact. I, I'm thinking of, I've got a couple uncles. God bless their heart. They come around our house boy, once every five or ten years. And they, they're nervous as the worm in a bucket of hot ashes when they come in our house. Because we don't have any, first thing, we don't allow them to smoke in our house. They have to go out in the driveway and smoke. And I got no beer in the ice box. And that does make them nervous. They, they automatically just go to the ice box and reach in. And there's no beer. And there's such a beautiful spirit of Christ in our home. And it's the light of Jesus that's condemning their darkness and makes them miserable. And after an hour, they, they tell me they're going to stay for three or four days. And after an hour, Uncle Frank will say, uh, uh, David, we've got to do some shopping. And I know where they're going. They're going to the nearest bar. And, and they come back about three hours later, their breath just reeking with alcohol. 
And they'll sit around for about another hour just waiting for us to preach at them. No, we don't preach at them, but they expect it. And, and, and they'll sit there for about an hour and you can see them. Uh, they're, they're fidgety and they're, 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 they're chewing their nails and they're nervous because there's something about us that they don't like. There's something about us that makes them miserable. And after another hour, Uncle Frank will say, uh, listen, David, uh, we have it's been so long since we've sent, seen uh, your brother Jerry. We're going to have to take off. We'll see you again sometime soon. They haven't been there two hours and they're gone. Do you have relatives like that? Well, folks, on the judgment day, one of these days, Brother Uncle Frank and a whole multitude of people like that are going to want nothing more than to see another smiling face of another Christian. That's all they're going to want to see because they're going to be gone with others who have never known Christ. You see, they want to be around their own kind. Having received and known the knowledge of God, they refused it. They love to be with their own crowd. They not only love to do those things, they they take place in those who do the same thing. Now, these are the people that have the program in their hands, so to speak. On the judgment day, suppose this one I'm talking about stands at the judgment and he's surrounded by 3,000 Muslims from Iran. They've never heard of the judgment. Suddenly they're zapped to the judgment day. They say, where are we? What's happening? And this man says, well, I'll tell you what, we're at the judgment day. Who knowing the judgment of God? And the books are going to be open, and those whose names are not written in Lamb's book of life will be cast in the eternal lake of fire. He's going to know it all, having known it. You know, there are some people sitting here right now who have never received Christ as Lord, yet you've heard enough gospel to save all of China. I could take you to Hong Kong, China, and hold a street rally among the kids who speak English in the streets of Hong Kong, and I'll say, look, I've got a friend from Reno, Nevada. Now, he's not a Christian, but he sure knows how to be one. He's heard it ever since he's a child. And I'll get on the microphone and say, I want my friend from Reno just to tell you what he knows. And you can get up and tell what you've heard in Sunday school. How Christ uh, was born in Bethlehem, how he lived 33 years. And and uh, he was nailed to a cross. And he was raised the third day. And he went to the Father. And he says, anyone who believes on him can be saved and have eternal life. You just tell them what you've heard. Simple, simple story. Then I'll get up and give the invitation. I'll get 5,000 people saved and you'll still be standing there. I know that because God honors his word. And yet there are people, there are people in America that have heard, there are people sitting here now. You have heard so much about Jesus Christ and what he can do. You know the way completely. Yet you are built around your cell who, knowing the judgment of God, they're still bound by their love for pleasure. They're going to be people at the judgment day who thought they had the whole world in their hand. You see, we think of the judgment day as being a place for losers. Oh no, this is what the world calls winners standing here before God, before Jesus Christ. See, they did it their way. They did you ever hear Frank Sinatra? And I did it my way. Mm-hmm. Two Rolls Royces, names in the headline, jet setters. Now, who's going to the judgment? Elvis Presley will be there. Now, I'm not saying whether he's a Christian or a sin. I'm not judging that. Whether he goes to the judgment seat, however you believe it. We're all headed for a judgment. You name anyone. Name Jim, John Paul Getty. Name any famous person you've ever heard of. Let, let, let me illustrate it. The Rolling Stones and Mick Jaggers. Mick Jaggers, by the way, if you don't know the Rolling Stones, the most vile rock group in the world. And if you're sitting here as a Christian and you can believe that you can listen to their garbage, you need your, hair, your spiritual head examined. You need to get a hold of God. If you can take a man, a group who claims to be anti-Christ and anti-God, and listen to their music, something's wrong. You really don't know the same Savior that I know. And I'll say that from my heart. Because Mick Jaggers claims that he's an antichrist. He claims that he's anti-God. And he claims that he's going to hell. He boasts about going to hell. So for the illustration of my message this afternoon, I'm going to place Mick Jaggers at the judgment seat. The great white throne judgment. Here he is now. He's standing before Jesus, the judge. Now, listen. He's had all the fame and the money and the wealth. He's had a whole generation idolize him. He said everything that money could buy. But here he is now at the judgment day. 
He stands before Jesus, the righteous judge. He stands there naked and alone. There's nobody to lean on. There's nobody that can bail him out. You can look back across eternity and that world, that earth that he came from is no longer there. There's not a single dollar bill left. There's not a Rolls Royce. They've all melded with a fervent heat. There's nothing left. There's not a newspaper to carry his name. There's not one single gold bar left. There is nothing that he held on to. There's nothing. It's all gone. There's no place left. And he stands there. And I know exactly what Jesus, the judge, is going to say to Mick Jaggers and his kind. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world in exchange for his soul? Now, folks, what is it that you're willing to give up? What are you going to sell your soul for? Come on, what is it? Is it your house, your job, your car? I've seen women so wrapped up in their home, it's their God. I've seen people wrapped up in their cars and their jobs and their pleasures. Well, folks, it's all going to melt. There's nothing you own that's worth anything. It's all going to go up in a puff of smoke. And we're going to stand before Jesus having nothing of this earth good. There's going to be nothing left. And I don't understand why people lose sleep and spend so much time grabbing and reaching and... I'm just driving here to the meeting down the main street on Sunday. You see all these people there pulling those things out in there, sticking those things in there, looking for a pot of gold. That blows my mind. You know, some of those people standing for they're still going to be going like this. It's all, you see, little old Dear little ladies in their 70s, sitting there, sticking those. Folks, on the judgment day, there'll not be a slot machine left. There'll not be a keno table anywhere. There'll be nothing left. It's all gone. Think of that now. Folks, this has changed my life. It Actually, there's nothing in this world that I thank God for what I have. I thank Him for my car and my house. I thank Him for the clothes on my back. I thank Him for the good food. We're to use these things to His glory. We're to thank Him for it. We're not to be condemned by what God has blessed us with. We're to give as much as we can and, and do as much as we can with what He's given us. But folks, some of us become addicted to that. And the Bible said, What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There's nothing in this world that I'm going to give in exchange for mine. How about you? Glory to God. Nothing in this world. All right, let's go to the judgment day now. Come on, put your thinking cap on for just a minute. Let's go to the judgment day. How and for what are we going to be judged? Now, the Bible said Jesus is going to be the judge. Listen to it. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all the judgment to the Son. That's John 5, 22 and John 5, 27. And hath given him the authority to execute the judgment. Jesus said, God the Father has given me the authority to be the judge. I'm going to be your judge on that great white throne judgment day. All right, let's go to that scene right now. What's the first thing that's going to happen? All right, first of all, there's going to be a count-off. There's going to be a count-off. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Now listen very closely. I believe that the sheep, those of us who are redeemed, are those on the right hand, the great host of witnesses. And I believe we're going to be there to witness his righteous judgment on the sinner. And before he judges a single sinner, he's going to say, my gospel works. The truth prevailed. Here are the mighty host of witnesses. They received my word. They are my redeemed. He's going to confess us before the Father and all the angels of heaven and before the whole world. He's going to confess us as his children. Listen to it now. Here's what Jesus said. And he shall sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. Now, I've never been able, like some people teach, and I think even Schofield teaches that this is a separation of nations, sheep nations and goat nations. Folks, not since Calvary. He does not deal by nations. He deals individually, one by one, under the blood. He deals with each individual by the blood. There's no one nation that's all sinners and all saints. Not even the United States. Not even, there is no sheep nation in the world where everybody is redeemed. Everybody's a believer. 
these, this represents the people of the nations. He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left hand. And he'll say to the goats, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, people, I think I have a little idea of what that's going to be like. First of all, if you're a Christian now, picture this in your mind. Is there any way the human mind can comprehend what it's going to be like when Jesus stands before the whole world and confesses us as his children? And he says, these on the right, these are my sheep. These are redeemed through my blood. These are my children. Father, these are yours. Through my blood, through my sacrifice at Calvary, I present to you your children. They're ours. Folks, as far as I'm concerned, that's where heaven begins. To turn around and to be rubbing shoulders with Abraham. To turn around and see Moses to my left. And to turn around and see Paul, the apostle. And there's John, and there's Mark, and there's Miriam. And there's Joshua, and there's Caleb, and there's Billy Graham, and there's D.L. Moody, and there's all these wonderful missionaries from all over the world, from all denominations, and all the saints, from all the tribes, all those who were beheaded for the sake of the gospel from all times. Oh, hallelujah. There's Dorcas, and all the, to turn around and to be numbered among the righteous. Folks, Right then and there to know, I am redeemed. I am one of them. I am one of His children. Now, for I'm as saved as I'm ever going to be right now. I'm not going to be any more saved then than I am now. But folks, there's going to be a bit of a difference to know that you're beyond the reach of the devil. You're on the, you can never be lost. That you're absolutely saved in His grace and power. Now, that's where I stand right now by His love and by faith, living an overcoming life. But at that moment, to know that you've crossed that line beyond the veil. You can't, the devil can't touch you. Now, folks, what a day, a glorious moment when he shall stand as a shepherd and say to those on his right, my beloved sheep. Oh, hallelujah. And then to the unconverted, to the hard-hearted, to the unrepentant, to those who have not made Christ the Lord of their life. You curse it. Goats, moon, somewhere to the left of the Father, to the left of the throne, there's a line. I don't know what kind of line it is. But folks, this is where hell begins as far as I'm concerned. To be numbered among transgressors. Now that was the pain of Gethsemane. It wasn't the pain of the body. It wasn't the idea of the thorns. No, Jesus sweat great drops of blood because he knew he had to be numbered among transgressors. He knew he had to rub shoulders with them on the cross. He knew that he had to be numbered with them. He had to take his place with transgressors. Now, folks, get this picture. I've, I've had just a little taste of that. I've gone down to East Village in New York where all the gay bars are in Greenwich Village. I've worked those streets for 20 years. And you go into a gay bar with a Christian friend who's got a brother in a back table. That brother is in despair at the verge of suicide. And he says, David, please go talk to him. He'll listen to you. And you stand out in front of that gay bar and you look inside and hardly believe your eyes. Men are dancing cheek to cheek and the room is filled with pot smoke. Men are lined up at the bar like almost like ravenous animals, and everybody that walks in, they turn and they leer at them. And you know that inside that bar are sodomites, rapists, rapists, anything you can name. Inside that bar are the dregs of New York City. And you walk inside that bar, and the moment you walk in, you can feel the coldness, you can feel the clutching at your throat, because the light that's in you is condemning the darkness around you. It screams at that darkness. You can feel the demonic powers. 
You can feel the demon spirits in that world. Now, folks, I, I know that I've seen that. I've witnessed that. And you walk halfway through the bar and everybody's staring at you and leering at you. They know there's something different about you. And they, and you get halfway and you begin to feel the choking. And, and I almost passed out. I had to turn and run out the door. And I grabbed the lamp post and I began to breathe that clear air. And I said, oh, God, thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you that I don't have to live in that. Thank you that I'm not one of them. Thank you, Jesus, that you saved me out of that. I don't have to be in there. I don't have to be one of them. I don't have to be numbered with those transgressors. Folks, I've been to the Raperbahn in Hamburg, Germany. I was there for crusades. And the Raperbahn is a whole section of Hamburg, Germany that's set aside for the worst filth, it's a sin city within the city. You have to enter through gates. It's a whole section of Hamburg, Germany. It's the worst sin spot in the whole world. And I thought I'd seen everything. A missionary said, now, David, you've got to go with your team to the Raper Bond and see how the devil's just vomited out of hell, and, and you'll have your heart broken forever till Jesus comes. And I said, well, I've seen everything. There's nothing you could show me that I haven't even seen yet. But folks, we walked, each member of our team was a different missionary, and I walked in with the, one of the chairman of our crusade. And folks, as soon as we walked in the Raper Bond, first thing you see are the houses of prostitution, three and four stories high, and prostitutes from all over the world, all colors, all races, and it's a flesh market. They're selling their bodies in an open, peddling their flesh, the flesh market. And you see men from all over the world there. You go down this street, and this one street features nothing but sadomasochists. They're on stage beating each other with belts and chains. And the congregation, the people sitting there drinking and leering and, and, and lusting. You walk down this other street, and it's all sex with human beings and animals. You walk down another street, and it's all for homosexuals. This street, all for lesbians. And another street, it's for every kind of, 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 of fake rape scenes, everything else. Beyond anything I could describe. Now, Paul said it's a shame to speak of the things they do in secret. But this is not done in secret. It's done openly. And, folks, I hadn't been there 15 minutes. And I actually thought that I was dreaming that God had allowed me somehow to walk through hell for just a few moments to break my heart. You could see people walking towards you with those sunken cheeks. And you knew all around you, gamblers, pimps, pickpockets, prostitutes, alcoholics, drug addicts. I mean, from all over Europe and the United States, they had gravitated. One thing held them together. And you could feel the demon powers hanging in the air. It was suffocating. In fact, I thought I would pass out. And I grabbed the sleeve. I grabbed the arm of my associate and, and the gentleman who took me there. And I said, please, get me out to the nearest exit. And we literally ran to the nearest exit. And I ran to the car. And the rest of my team was already waiting in the car. And when we got in the car... We all began to raise our hands and praise the Lord. And I could feel the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ and His love through my heart. And I thought, and I, I could hardly sleep that night. And I thought about it so much. While I'm standing here now in the Raper Bonner, all of those creatures, all of them, their, 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 their whole minds and bodies consumed by their lust. And I thought to myself, that's what, that's what it's going to be like on the judgment day when the Lord says, to my left. You go, you reprobate, you had no time for me. I called and called, you refused so move. And sinner, you turn around and there's idiot men to your right. There's Adolf Hitler to your left. And there are all the rapists and all the pornographers and all the meat cleaver murderers and all of the dregs of humanity, every, every hard-hearted gay from every gay bar on the face of the earth. Every rapist you've ever raped, the son of Sam, you name any one of them, they're all going to be there. Mussolini, Stalin, all of the dictators from all of the world, they're all going to be there. And sinner, you're going to be right there because that's exactly what the Bible says. You will be numbered with transgressors. The next thing on the agenda, the Bible said the books are going to be opened. The books are going to be open. Now, folks, there are two sets, there, there are two kinds of books. Now, listen closely to this. This is next on the agenda. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. 
and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works. You see, the Christian has only one book because only names are in it. It's called the book of life. But the sinner has a biography. Every sinner has a book. The Bible said, and the books were opened and another book was opened. The Christian has a name in it, and that's all, because, folks, when you're under the blood and you're saved, your sins are all washed away, you have no past history, it's all gone. You stand there with a redeemed, blood-washed name. No sin against you, no crime against you, redeemed. All you're going to do is call them out. Oh, hallelujah. David Wilkerson, Gwen Wilkerson, Jimmy Brown, they're all going to be there. I don't know what your name is, but if you're under the blood... Listen to what the Bible says. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. That's, we're going to have white raiment on us. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and all the angels. Hallelujah. First thing you're going to do is call our names out. We're going to count down. Hallelujah. You're going to confess it. Then, the sinner... One by one, every knee bow, every eye shall be all of them, every tongue shall confess. Stand before him. Now, I don't know if the angels were the scribes that recorded these books or not. And I used to think it went something like this. Your name was called as a sinner. You stood before Christ. You nailed. You wept. You confessed him as Lord. It's too late, but you have to confess that he is the Savior of the world. It won't do you any good at this time, but you confess him. And then the Bible says you're going to be judged according to those things written in the books. Now, I used to think it went like this. Your name was called, and it says, uh, January 3rd, 11 o'clock, you committed adultery. And the name of the parties involved. And all the things that happened that night. On this day, February 14th, you cheated on your income tax. On this day, you took God's name in vain 25 times. You beat up your wife and all these things. They were all going to be all the terrible things that everybody had ever done. Now, folks... I'm not, that's not where I'm at now. I really don't believe that's the way it is. I don't believe the sinner's going to be judged so much for what he's done as for what he's not done. You remember when Jesus, just before he died, stood over the city of Jerusalem and he wept? He wasn't weeping now over the adult and the fornication. He wasn't weeping over their backsliding. No. He wasn't weeping about what they were doing at all. Jesus was crying about something they weren't doing. You know what he said? Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. All I wanted to do was gather you under my wings like a mother hen gathers her little chicks. But you would not. So your house has left you desolate. He said, all I wanted to do was to be your your guide. I wanted to comfort you. I wanted to show you a way out, but you would. Do you know what I believe is in the book? Not what you've done, but what you've not done. You know what I believe is going to be? Your name is called. You stand before Jesus, the judge. The angel opens the book. And here's what it says. January 3rd, 11 o'clock in the morning. You were watching... Rex Humboldt, you heard 13 scripture verses. I believe there's going to be a replay. He doesn't need tape recorders, not God. He just, just instantly, for the whole world, is going to be replayed. On this day, a friend came to you and talked to you about your need of a Savior. I called you through this person. On this day, you were going to work and you felt empty and alone. And I tugged at your heart and I pulled and I said, this is the day. Don't run any further. I called you here. I called you here. I called you here. The name, the time, the date, the place, every script you've ever heard, every tug, every pull of the Holy Spirit, it's all going to be there. And I don't, I can't convince myself God's near concerned about gambling, drinking, alcohol, and adultery as he is about you turning down his love. Where he called you and said, all I want to do is guide you. I want to, you see, this is not a message of fear. This is a message of hope. And that's, that's what Jesus, Jesus, I didn't come to condemn you. I didn't come to condemn you at all. And folks, that's what bothers me. Some people say, David, you really believe in a hell that God still sends people to a fiery hell? Well, folks, in the first place, Jesus, God never invented hell for Christians, or, or rather for people. That was for the devil and his angels. In fact, you can't, God, Jesus said, I wasn't willing that any should perish and go to hell. He didn't make hell for people. In fact, you can't even get to hell until you claw your way there. You have to fight your way to get to hell. You have to resist the Holy Ghost. You have to resist preaching like this. You have to resist Christian friends and praying relatives. You have to, to get to hell, you have to really want it. And he said, he'll give you the desire of your heart. You see, and that's what people don't understand. He did make hell for people. He made it for the devil. But he said, if you're going to be his child and you prefer to walk that way, Jesus said, all I wanted to do was guide you. 
I spread out my wings and I sent missionaries and evangelists to call you and say, come, I'll, I'll show you the way. I'm the way. Just gather, humble yourself, come to me. I'll show you the way. I'll give a purpose to your life. I'll lead you. You can stand before me in assurance. You can stand before me knowing that you're redeemed. You didn't have to do that. And folks, that's what the judgment is. That's what's in the book. And oh, there are going to be some surprises in those books. There are going to be some people stand before Jesus screaming, There's been a mistake, Master. Look in the book of life. Why, well, I carried a Bible around. I went to prayer meetings. I prophesied, man. I prayed for the sick. I went around saying, Jesus, Jesus, Lord, Lord. You ever hear that scripture? Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me on that day, what day? The judgment day. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? In your name, didn't we cast out devils? And in your name, didn't we do many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never even knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Now, folks, that scares me that there's going to be a whole group of people, a whole segment of society deceived on the judgment day who thought that they were doing right and that they're redeemed, but they're lost. Now, folks, I used to ask my dad when I was a young preacher. I started preaching when I was 14 years old. I said, Dad, what's that scripture meant? And that scripture haunted me. What does it mean there are going to be people? Many say on that day, Lord, Lord, we prophesied. We cast out devils. We healed the sick. We did great works. We said, Jesus, Jesus, we used your name. And the Lord said, I didn't even know you. I said, Dad, how can that be? And my dad said, well, that must, that must be some of those healing evangelists that went bad or something, David. And nobody could explain that. But that came back to me about eight years ago when the Jesus revolution broke out. In fact, almost ten years ago, I heard about the psychedelic Christians in San Francisco, in Haight-Ashbury. So I went to Haight-Ashbury. Left New York for a couple of weeks, and I went to Haight Ashbury. I heard of a whole group up there uh, that had been in drugs and had been saved, and uh, they had a mission down in the streets of San Francisco. So I went down there, and they invited me to a communion service. And I never met such beautiful people. All they did was talk about love. They said, "Hey man, Christ is a cool cat. Hey man, I got zapped by the sky man in the sky pad. Like wow, he's heavy, heavy, heavy man. He's heavy." Everything was cool, everything was heavy, everything was that. And everything was oozing with love. Everything was just love. So I thought, boy, some great new work of the Holy Ghost. And so they were having communion. And they were passing out these hunks of bread. Everybody broke off a piece of bread and, and, and passing out the juice. And, and all of a sudden, one after another, they start lighting up joints of marijuana. And I said, wait a minute. You smoke pot at communion? Oh, yeah, man, we dropped acid too. Last week we all dropped acid and went out along a river and studied the book of Revelation. Man, even the beast came to life. Then they had a, they had a healing service and they called it zapping and they went around, zap the devil out of people. And they were going like that. And they said, the devil's gone, the devil's gone, casting out devils. And I went home. That night, absolutely incredulous, because a national magazine, a Christian magazine, had had a big story talking about the new psychedelic Christianity that's sweeping America. And I was there at the beginning of it, and I saw what was happening. And then I looked at that scripture again. It says, many, many, it's not just a few, many, many, a whole segment of society, and then I began to see these people didn't know the first thing about being born again. They knew nothing about holiness and righteousness. My Bible says, come out from among them, be ye separate and clean, saith the Lord. Then I receive you as my son or daughter. They had not come out of the world. Christ was another trip in a series of, he's another high in a series of highs. I've been up on speed, I've been up on acid, I've been up on plot, might as well get up on Jesus. They weren't born again. They were just whitewashing it. They were still living in adultery. They were sleeping with one another, smoking pot, then using drugs and getting high and stoned on acid and speed with the Bible in their hand. Now, folks, that's wrong. And what's happened to us is that we've lost our spirit of discernment. 
I say that's wrong, and I say there's something in every spirit-filled Christian that rebels against that. Something else that I rebel against. And those people who talk in tongues and drink scotch, and they go speak in pickled tongues. I'm going to unload my guns good the first time. I still believe it's possible, no matter how dirty and filthy this age becomes, it's still possible to live for Jesus, clean and holy. I met an evangelist on an airplane with his girlfriend, one of the top evangelists in America, drinking one cocktail after another. His wife had just, my wife and I have been trying to help his dear wife. He's been traveling the country with an atheist, an alcoholic. And this just bothers me that we've lost our discernment in the church. It bothers me. And I still say it's possible. And these people need to be exposed. They need to be exposed. I went up to that dear man and said, I've heard you on television preach against that. And I see you sitting here drinking one cocktail after another. I've talked to your wife. And that's your secretary. And you're running around the country with her. Your wife at home broken hearted. How can you stand and preach the gospel? Why don't you go out and get a job? Why don't you work for a living? And I said, I love you. If you go back to your wife, I'll help you. I'll do everything I can. And folks, God's going to expose all that. He's going to pull back the curtains. And He's going to come for a house that's redeemed. A house that's clean and pure by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm asking Jesus to do it. I'm not a judge. But I still, I can't believe that Jesus is pleased. I can't believe the Holy Ghost is pleased with all these double standards in America now. And on the judgment day, folks, we're going to learn the truth. All right, the books are going to be open. Then what happens to the sinner? The Bible said he's bound hand and foot by the angel of God, and he's taken to a passage called outer darkness. He's bound. Now, folks, I don't, I don't believe that that's an actual chain and an actual cord. He's going to wrap them up and bind them. I believe it's a supernatural binding. I think it's just a touch of God. And there's a supernatural binding of that eternal soul. I've heard people say, there can be no hell. I'm in hell now. The only hell you get is what you have here on earth. Now, folks, I believe there's a hell. And any preacher who says there's no hell is saying this, telling the same lie that the devil told to Eve. Thou shalt surely not die. It's the same old lie. The devil told it to Eve. And they're still pre- In fact, Dr. Savage, a theologian, said, I wouldn't believe in hell if it were on every page of the Bible. If we're on every page of the Bible, I still couldn't accept it. And I've had people, I had one meeting as many as 50 people walk out when I started talking about hell. One of them I suspected to be a minister. And, and people say, in, in this sophisticated age, can you really believe that God would send people to a fiery, flaming, eternal hell? Well, the Bible says that they were cast into a lake of fire. They were taken to outer darkness. Now, folks... You've not been to hell until you stand before the throne of God. You've not been to hell until he says, out of my sight, out of my presence. You've not been to hell until the angel of the Lord binds your hand and foot. You've not been to hell until you stand at that gapping hole at the mouth of that outer darkness. Now, I don't know where that is. I don't know. I can't begin to explain that to you. But evidently, outer darkness is the first glimpse of eternal damnation. You've not been to hell until you stand in front of that, that icy blackness, knowing that the moment you're cast into that passage, never again to hear a scripture, never hear a gospel message or a gospel song, never again to see or hear of Christ or His love, cast completely away from His presence, never again to see a friendly face of a Christian, and to be cast into that mouth of outer darkness and pass further and further away from the presence of God. You have not been to hell until finally you stand face to face with the serpent, the devil, Satan himself, the Antichrist on one side, the beast on the other, and all the fallen angels around him. You have not been to hell until Satan himself reaches out to claim your soul for an eternity, saying, you are mine. I've had people say, well, Dave, do you actually believe that there's going to be literal flames and fire like we see out of a furnace or hot lava that spews out of the earth in a volcano? Oh, folks, that kind of fire couldn't be hot enough. That couldn't be hot enough. 
I believe there's a supernatural fire that our mind can't even comprehend. You call it consuming regrets, call it anything you want. But let me tell you what I believe the terror of hell is going to be. I believe that the pain and the terror of hell is instant replay. I believe the terror and the agony, I believe that that fire that eats away at the soul and, and gets hotter and hotter and never peaks out, it gets worse and worse. It's a flame in that eternal soul that has to live with the regret. I believe that when sinners go to hell, they're going to be able to place themselves back in time through their mind through some process are going to be able to sit in this audience again. Some of you that are here now that are going to reject Jesus Christ. On that day, what I'm telling you now will be replayed. You'll see the people around you. You'll see me standing on stage. You'll see the instruments. You'll see it all. It'll be replayed just as it happened. You'll hear the invitation, come to Jesus. You'll hear the sermon about judgment being played again. You'll hear a Mr. Wilkerson screaming at the top of his voice, Come! You don't have to be lost. And folks, this is the agony of hell to replay that and, and say, I'm going to go. I'm going to do it. And then suddenly it dawns on you that you're in eternity that you can't. And I believe that the agony of hell is to know that you could have taken that step. All I had to have done, all I would have had to do was to take that move. All I would have had to do was swallow my pride. I could have been saved. I could have been redeemed. I could have been with Jesus Christ. I could have had the eternal joy of the Lord. I didn't have to be here. I didn't have to be lost. Folks, the agony of hell is to replay every chance you've had. Every invitation. Every time somebody tapped you on the shoulder and in love said, come, you replay it all. You know what bothers me? In all my meetings, dozens of young people come. Some of you are sitting here right now. And I'm pouring my heart out to you. You say, well, I'll take my chances. I'm not a drug addict. I'm not a junk. I'm a pretty good person. Well, your goodness, the Bible said, is filthy rags in the sight of God. It means nothing. You have to have that experience with him. Jesus said, if you're ashamed to confess me before men, I'll be ashamed to confess you before the Father. But if you confess me publicly before men, then I confess you before the Father and all the angels of heaven.